Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another 84th edition of monthly Internet Governance and Digital Policy Briefing uh, by Geneva Internet Platform and Digital Foundation. Uh, obviously, we are going to go through the main developments uh, in digital space in April. And uh, for those of you that are new to this briefing, we start with a couple of uh, chosen trending topics of the month. We run in depth discussing together with you those topics, and then we'll briefly cover the other relevant developments as well as what might be coming in the next month. Uh, since this is supposed to be a sort of an open discussion, we do have a number of uh, Diploi experts who are going to get involved in discussion and trying to analyze the topics and developments, but we do want to hear from you as well. And in that sense, as always, please feel free to use chat to the maximum extent possible to raise questions, comments, um, your own opinions, uh, something that we might have missed maybe in the analysis. Uh, and if you feel like, you can also raise a hand and jump in in discussion at a later point. To help us with uh, picking up on your points in chat, uh, today again we have uh, our colleague uh, Ginger Pak, live from the US, where it's early morning still. And Ginger will try to uh, read through and then occasionally bring in your comments and suggestions and reflections into our discussion. Unlike in previous months when most of our colleagues from the GIP and Diplo experts were mainly online, uh, this time we also have uh, my dear colleague Andriana, who is uh, sitting next to me, and uh, she'll help us shed more light on uh, some particularly cybersecurity aspects of the trends of this month. So let's dive straight into the first two trending topics of the month. Uh, we were trying to follow on what was hot and it appeared that in April, this sort of cybersecurity or mainly dominated cybersecurity relations uh, were quite a trending topic. Yes, in the recent two or three days, we had also some breakthroughs with the uh, uh, in Europe with the G Digital Service Act and uh, now, of course, the buzzword about uh, uh, Elon Musk buying Twitter. Uh, we'll reflect shortly on that uh, a little bit afterwards, but certainly leave that for further discussions, most likely uh, in May. For this month, we have chosen two topics. The first one is related to US-Russia relations, uh, certainly in the context of the Ukrainian conflict, but with much broader set of uh, reflections and consequences to digital governance. And the second trend is actually the uh, substantive meeting of the UN open-ended working group, which is interesting because it was the first major of very um, direct negotiations on an important cyber topic where uh, during the U Ukrainian conflict, we have both the Russians and the US and all the other member states of the UN negotiating. So we'll look into whether there was any progress or not. Let's start with the first topic, uh, and we'll dive into the US-Russia relations. And probably the key uh, update, the key news, is that many of you have been following, I'm sure, uh, on our work in the previous month since June last year, when President Biden and President Putin met in Geneva. We hope for some cyber detente, uh, maybe softening the relations when it comes to cyberspace, but it appears that at least for now, cyber detente and cyber dialogue between US and Russia is that. So I'm bringing in, uh, straight from Geneva, uh, Diplos director, uh, Jovan Kurbalia, to tell us more about what has actually happened, what is the history of those relations and what that can mean for the bilateral relations, for digital policy on a global level. There were also some other developments like the setup of the UN, of the US uh, Cyber Bureau and so on. So, Jovan, uh, welcome to, uh, to the stage and uh, let us know what are the, the, the perspectives on these new developments. Jovan. Uh, hi, Vlada. Yes, definitely, you, you, as you indicated, last June there were high hopes that we may have cyber detente. And interestingly enough, there were quite a few uh, promising signals. Probably you can notice that there were less news about attacks uh, exchange uh, between Russia and the United States for quite some time. Obviously, the Ukraine war, which is, uh, which is uh, some uh, really 
earthquake in global geopolitics uh, also influenced the, um, this process of cyber detente. And we had basically, uh, I hope, pause or uh, maybe the end of cyber detente and recent decision by US government to pull out from uh, these, uh, these exchanges. Therefore, for time uh, being, we don't, we don't know if there is any communication between Washington and Moscow when it comes to cyber. It was, it was established some sort of red line or red phone or red uh, WhatsApp, whatever you call these days, or telegraph. But uh, there are uh, what we are hearing generally about, about exchange between, uh, between the United States and Russia is that it's, um, it seems that there is a break in, uh, in communication. Therefore, the cyberspace is uh, becoming again highly uncertain and we can, uh, we can expect, unfortunately, uh, more uh, negative news about potential cyber attacks uh, beyond, uh, beyond the, the, the Ukraine war and conflict. That's the, the first uh, bad news, uh, but uh, one couldn't expect anything else given the overall developments in global geopolitics and the war itself. Uh, the second development uh, which you mentioned is establishment of the new bureau in the State Department, which deals with cyber and digital issues. And it's an interesting development. We'll share the blog post which I wrote after the establishment because they're trying to uh, uh, cover holistically digital diplomacy. And this is by far the biggest challenge for most countries worldwide. In my blog post, I argue that the country that managed to extend to have this cross-cutting coverage of digital issues will basically uh, be in the best position to protect their uh, and promote their national interest in cyber field. We know in the past that there was a, a cyber department dealing mainly with cyber security during, during Obama administration, and there was more social economic uh, ITU department. Now it is, uh, uh, integrated in one department. Therefore, that's trend. We'll see how it will work. Uh, it is a new dynamics, and it is a whole challenge first for the US diplomacy to develop a US, de US State Department as a whole approach, then US government as a whole approach, and US, uh, and the US country as a whole approach. These challenges exist all over the world. We saw it with digital foreign policy strategies. Uh, Switzerland introduced two years ago foreign policy strategy, European Union is trying in Brussels to make these convergences. And the reason is very practical. Digital is challenging traditional organization of the governments, companies, uh, and any setup, because the very nature of digital communication flows across the professional silos. I al always mention a uh, uh, question of data, Data is uh, the best example where you have a technical artifact impacted by standards a lot, also impacted by human rights, privacy protection, security, e-commerce, and then in other fields like health, humanitarian, ICRC recently had a quite uh, serious cyber attack when data was compromised about people protected by ICRC. Now, if you want to cover that, you cannot just discuss standardization without understanding human rights, for example, or e-commerce. You can, but those would be suboptimal solution. There were, those are two uh, developments, one relatively short, sad news, pause or the end of the cyber det detente. And second, an interesting development in the US State Department for holistic digital diplomacy, which is mimicked in many governments. Many governments are trying to find optimal solution. It's not easy because governments, this change is going against the, let's, let's say a few hundred years of development of government structure. On the top, you have obviously turfs in the governments. And for those of you who are interested in finding the solution, I advise, especially older one could recall to read Yes Minister as a textbook for understanding the, what's going on now in many governments facing the challenge of the digitalization and uh, digital diplomacy in general. Thank you. Thank you, Jovan. Uh, there are a couple of very interesting reflections which we can get back to, and I basically invite all of you uh, to share in the chat your thoughts about how these relations between US and Russia and this maybe the ending of cyber detente for now 
deterioration of, of their relations will impact um, negotiations in various fora, including maybe the competition for the ITU and so on. And on the other hand, uh, what could the other countries learn, particularly developing countries, but not only from uh, this new model of having a bureau uh, in, in, in the US? We'll get back to that uh, in a few minutes. But before that, uh, let me bring the, the microphone back to Andriana. Andriana, you've been the, the person behind Cyber Ditan, so it will be quite boring now for some months uh, not to follow monthly the, the, the steps, step up of their relations. But let's hope that you have some, some more work to do in, in the uh, near future. For the time being, what you have fo focused now on was uh, a lot of relations between the US and Russia when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to uh, uh, relations towards the big tech and so on. So what's new in, in that field? When it comes to sanctions, on the very last day of March, the US sanctioned Russian companies that supply the Russian military with uh, satellite Im imagery and such, and also what they called Russian malicious cyber actors. What's interesting to note is uh, that the largest Russian chip maker, Micron, was also on that list. But what's more interesting to note is who wasn't on that list. Um, the White House has already been, let's say, warned by uh, activists that it's not very good for Russian citizens to be cut off from the Internet. Uh, and what did happen is that the Treasury Department decided to allow telecommunication companies to provide uh, or supply and sell, I think what they said, uh, software for ICT communications. Another actor that didn't find itself on the sanctions list was Russia's based Kaspersky. And there was an interesting reflection or a report saying that the US and the EU don't want to sanction Kaspersky because they are afraid of cyber attacks that will come in um, from, from other Russian actors. Uh, so we'll see what happens on that front. But for now, Kaspersky is on the list of um, actors that can uh, endanger national security in the US, but still not sanctioned. So we'll see, we'll see about that. Uh, when it comes to sanctions from the other side, Russia has been having very tense relations with Google and Wikimedia. Google has been fined already by Russia's telecommunication watchdog, Roskomnadzor, uh, two times. Uh, once the amount was 4 million rubles, the second time was 7 million rubles. And it's basically about what Russia calls fake news on the situation in Ukraine. Wikimedia has the same problem that Google has. Uh, in addition to that, Roskomnadzor is saying that YouTube is allowing videos from uh, Ukrainian far-right groups. So that's basically what they are uh, disagreeing on. And when it comes to disinformation, it's interesting to know that the UN High um, Human Rights Council adopted a draft resolution on misinformation that was sponsored by Ukraine. And also the US, which we already mentioned, UK, Latvia, Lithuania, I think I'm missing one country. Uh, and countries uh, have agreed that they will not support uh, disinformation campaigns, basically, and that they will fight fake news. We'll see uh, about I believe the content policy and fake news will be even more, uh, in, become even hotter topics in, in the following months. Thanks a lot. I, I, I take two maybe takeaways. One is that the US might be softening its position on sanctions when it comes to telecommunications. It basically goes in line with those discussions about disconnecting uh, Russia from the internet yes. uh, and uh, uh, disconnecting some of the broadband providers mm -hmm. and so on, so that the US is softening that and maybe allowing the communications to go mm -hmm. on. Uh, and the other one is this information, which is quite interesting and brings back to what Jovan mentioned, that uh, we have to have the full scope of discussions in different fora, mm -hmm. uh, because now we have this information in uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, we had some discussions within the UN uh, Open Energy Working Group, mm -hmm. even though that's not the, directly the mandate. Uh, we had some discussions about the content in the ad hoc committee on cybercrime. So it's really cross cutting in a way. And, yes, and it is. It's quite interesting. Good. Uh, again, encouraging you 
to come back with uh, with your comments and questions. I see there are a few reflections in the chat. I'll come back to Ginger in, in a minute. But before that, I wanted to bring back Jovan. Uh, so Jovan, uh, maybe your quick reflection on um, what are the implications of these relations, uh, Russia, US, on the developing countries, on other countries, and maybe more broadly even on digital policies. You mentioned the scope of work of the Bureau and, and how this is going to be more, ever, ever more intertwined. What do you say, Owen? Well, the, first, the, the, there are some good news even, even these days. One good news is that internet is still functioning and it's still operational across. Somebody sitting in, in uh, Kiev uh, can write uh, in uh, email, not necessarily Facebook and other, and other services, to uh, his uh, um, um, to somebody else in Moscow. Therefore, uh, it is one of the rare part of infrastructure, global infrastructure, which is still functioning on the global level. And I think we should not underestimate that uh, uh, sort of a strong feature of the internet and also not only in the internet technically, but also policy circles who realize that it uh, that endangering the internet could uh, at one point in the case of this war could uh, endanger the internet as a whole. Now, this is the first good news. Now, uh, uh, some less good news is that obviously the, the, this, this conflict will impact the rest of the global relations, not only in the field of uh, the digital field, but any other fields. What would be impacts on the on digital field? I think that the first thing is there will be much more, uh, much more suspicion. Uh, there will be push towards data localization. Governments will start thinking of, uh, of uh, how to ensure their national uh, IT infrastructure. Therefore, there will be some sort of push towards uh, uh, policy fragmentation around the, around the digital. Uh, we will see if the negotiation, the first and third committee discussion in IGF, in WTO, in other places and standardization body will manage to reconnect and uh, um, sort of uh, re-established its policy layer on the technical layer that can support integrated internet. It won't be easy because the relations are becoming geopolitically driven. Countries are basically um, more and more seeing advantage of protecting their national immediate interests than global public, public good. But governments worldwide will have to make tough decisions uh, what they are going to gain and lose from potential uh, uh, fragmentation of the internet, or let's say um, filtering of flow of data. That is, that is one of good aspect of this situation because we have to have real politic discussion without uh, um, empty rhetorics about phrases which, which do not mean anything. Ultimately, countries, communities, companies, you'll have to decide how they benefit from the integrated internet and what would be the risks of, uh, of uh, not being connecting. Uh, obviously, I'm a strong uh, believer that uh, a responsibly connected internet with the good rules is beneficial for all of us, but it may not be the view of other people. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I do have another follow-up question, but before that, I want to uh, get back to Ginger firstly. And to see Ginger, uh, I don't know whether there were any comments in chat and feel free to jump in with your own views. That's, uh, that's always also welcome. Ginger. Uh, thank, thank you, Vla. I, we haven't been an active uh, audience yet because we've been listening very much to uh, the comments that are going on. But it did occur to me, and please apologize, this is my own intervention now rather than as chat moderator. Um, with the comments that Andriana made earlier, if there's now a global and international concern, even the UN, about mis, dis, and fake information, does that mean that some tech giants and even individuals like Elon Musk will have to be brought into international discussions? How can that take place without bringing them into the conversation? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's exactly one of the questions I wanted a, a quick follow-up on. And, and again, I'm encouraging anyone uh, to jump in with the, with the thoughts in the chat. 
uh, to briefly bring in Jovan once more before we move to the next topic. Uh, so Jovan, uh, on disinformation, it seems like this is becoming the key uh, question in a way of the relations also between the, the uh, between US and, and, and uh, Russia. Uh, but it seems like uh, this is the next stage where actually the uh, the conflict is uh, is happening where this is a important argument when it comes to uh, disintegration of the internet and so on and now we had as, as ginger mentioned this news of uh, elon musk taking over twitter and maybe opening up uh, the space again for for a less of filtering and so on so jovan any reflections on this topic of disinformation and to what extent that could become the the key topic uh, of discussions in the next uh, in the next period Vlada, maybe it will be easier for Elon Musk to reach Mars than, than to fix the, the internet and uh, make more decent communication in internet space. We'll see. But obviously the guy is, uh, is, uh, is, has, has means, has money, and he has ideas, and he has a political drive. Therefore, that's a really interesting development. But what we are going to, what he is going to revisit and maybe uh, realize that it's much more difficult than to create Tesla car or the SpaceX program is that we are entering now in the social, cultural, to some extent, emotional, political issues. And uh, there was for a long time, uh, in my view, artificial division that people will say, oh, we have security of cables, but we don't care what's going on uh, through these cables. That wasn't sustainable. And we are coming to that point that we have to see what's going on through these cables or on tech platforms. We know we have a section 230 of the Deflammation Act, which is basically Bible of tech companies, which basically says that they are not responsible for any content. And it has to be revisited. How is it going to be revisited? Through self-regulation, which Facebook is trying, which maybe uh, Elon Musk will try, or through the public regulation, which we have in the Digital Service Act and in more and more uh, uh, public initiatives, where basically public authorities are saying, we are going to decide what is the free freedom of speech. We are going to decide what should be filtered. It cannot be done by, uh, by uh, private companies, whatever their motivation is. Because as you know, there is a conflict between Elon Musk and the predominant Silicon Valley group who argue for the more filtering and he's arguing for more freedom of communication. Therefore, we are going to revisit some fundamental issues of the governance of the digital space. I'm not sure that they will be resolved on international level. They will be to the large extent resolved in three capitals, Washington DC, uh, Brussels, in particular Brussels and Beijing. Maybe Delhi, Moscow, this, the, the other few places, but that will be, I think, dynamics in Brussels, especially with the digital services and digital market acting, will be the most interesting. And we may have some sort of GDPR effect or Brussels effect of a spillover to the rest of the uh, rest of the world. But don't have, underestimate Elon Musk. I'm really keen to see how he's going to solve this puzzle, which is much more difficult than making cars or, or, or making satellites. If he will be many, uh, able to manage, as you said. Uh, while you're there, uh, one more question was in the chat, and sorry, Ginger, for stealing that from you, but I think that was interesting, uh, which is uh, what are the prospects of uh, uh, IGF in, uh, in uh, Moscow in 2025? I mean, and, and the, this whole UN process uh, based on the, well, relations of the US and the whole Ukraine uh, crisis. I know it's more of the uh, sort of predictions which, which are hard to make, but any thoughts, Jovan? You're asking me, Vlada. Yeah, yeah. If uh, any any thoughts on, on on this prospect, yeah. As far as I can recall, there is no any formal decision for this hosting. I think it is done before uh, IGF, as you know, is a very flexible uh, governance structure. There were indications, obviously, that it should be in Sochi in 2025, but we don't know uh, what will happen. Uh, I can tell you, three years are like three centuries in the normal historical time in this, these days. Therefore, we don't know what will happen in three, in three years' time. But apart from the venue, which would be, would be important, especially if there is a, some sort of um, calming down of the geopolitical tensions, uh, is the question of 2025, where we'll have the decisions about continuation of the versus process, 
we'll have the decision about the future of IGF. We'll have also decision about uh, closure of the cybercrime negotiation in the ad hoc, ad hoc group and the OEVG in the first committee. Now, it is an interesting year. This is the reason why I drafted so-called cheat sheet for 2025 for people to uh, to um, uh, know what's uh, what's uh, what's going what they should uh, should follow therefore regardless venue which will be important issue like let's say IQ elections and many other issues that are also have a symbolic uh, relevance that will be an important year for the future of the digital governance and politics i d- i don't have any any news to share except the speculation. And I, I'm not sure that anyone, including you and Secretary General, can tell you today if there will be IGF in 2025 in Sochi. Yes, th- thank you. I mean, we had a more recent uh, uh, discussion on the, IG, on the upcoming IGF in Addis Abeba because of the developments in Ethiopia last year. Uh, now it seems uh, to be in place, but that, that sort of confirms your, your uh, understanding that this is a dynamic process. Excellent. Thank you, Jovan. Uh, We could continue, of course, but uh, let's move on to the second topic, which is related to this, and we already touched upon that. So the second trend of uh, from April is uh, the the meeting of the UN Open-Ended Working Group. As a reminder, the UN Open-Ended Working Group is um, a discussion on uh, how international law applies to cyberspace, uh, what are the cyber norms, what is the, the rules of behavior of states in cyberspace, developing confidence building measures, uh, capacity building, and so on. Uh, What is interesting is that this was a second substantive session, and in the meantime, since the first one, we have seen the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, a lot of tensions in between, some unsettled uh, agenda issues, and so on, but I'm not going to take much of the time. I want to pass floor back to Adriana, who has been uh, following closely uh, on what was happening. So, what was the main what were the main interesting points when it comes to the process or maybe the takeaways from this second uh, substantial session when it comes to this session the discussions took quite a long time to not settle on the modes of multi-stakeholder engagement this is a question that has been plaguing the process since it uh, started in june 2021 And we have this um, division between states that want um, stakeholders to non-governmental stakeholders to participate more. Then we have states that, uh, of course, do believe that such engagement is important, but that these stakeholders should not be present at the formal sessions. So kind of something like we had in the first OEWG, where there were special informal sessions during which Uh, countries could engage with the non-governmental stakeholders. There have been some proposals by the chair, by other uh, participants, other states, nothing was adopted. India, for example, said, okay, let's have the same mode we had in the first OEWG, but for the duration of one year. Uh, We don't have the text of that proposal anywhere online. It's not it's not accessible to anyone who is not a state participating in the OAWG, which frankly hurts the transparency of the process. The first process did seem to be much more transparent. There was another proposal by the chair, which we only know was revision one, and we don't know what exactly was in it, but we do know that uh, a certain amount of states said no. We do know that one of them was Russia. And those are the uh, the things that I can tell you. Anything else would be speculation on my part. What the OEWG needs to do now is solve this issue. And they do have the hope that they will manage to do so by July when the third substantive session will happen. I have no prognosis on that. I have to say that the chair is in a very tricky situation considering that all proposals were shut down I'm not sure on basis of of what they will negotiate on, but I am hoping that they will figure something something out by July. So just to to clarify, the importance of this is that last year, that was basically the first UN Mm -hmm. process of that kind, the first committee, not the only, where there was uh, some sort of a 
formal or informal, but some sort of involvement of other stakeholders, mm. rather than having the states speaking in a bubble without accessing. Yes. And that's, by the way, this nice illustration of the fishes in a, in a big fishes in a bubble. Uh, and there was a hope that this same format would at least continue mm. in the second round or in this new uh, open energy working mm. group, which is not actually happening, or at least it's not clear how this is going to look like. And because of that, they can't even continue with formal negotiations, so they're playing with informal. How does it go? That's tricky, but what they did in December, they said, okay, we don't have the modes of multi-stakeholder engagement, but we will set that question aside and we will discuss in a formal mode. In this session in March and April, they said, we don't have the modes, so we are not going to discuss in a formal mode. What we're going to do is we're going to switch to an informal mode. The first country that mentioned this was the first speaker on the docket, the very first day, and it was the UK. And then at the third meeting, so at the end of the second day, the chair said that the proposal actually came from him. Um, there were countries that said, okay, but we came here, we spent UN money, and now we are discussing informally. However, since the majority of states was uh, in favor of continuing informally, that's what happened. Uh, that no one is quite sure what that means, actually. As the US diplomat said, well, now I must confess to being thoroughly confused, to which I said, I absolutely agree with so you, <laughs> absolutely. Um, the countries are currently unsure if the inputs they gave during this session will find themselves in the annual report, which is coming up. We're also not sure which year that report is going to cover, but we're figuring it will cover June, December, and this session. Uh, the chair did promise the draft six weeks before the July session. So somewhere end of May and uh, beginning of June, we'll see what happened. Uh, w how this informal mode actually influenced that, that report. So basically the format now influences the substance and the substantial discussion yes. of what might come out of, of Yes, that. it's a very interesting situation that we haven't really seen before. In the OAWG, it is usually the UN's practice that if we can't agree on, on the program of work, we will continue informally. But this is the first time the OAWG has come into, into such a position. Before moving on to Pavlina to tell us more about mm. the substance of discussions, a quick question on what can we expect uh, when it comes to the process in July? Mm. There were some tensions between Russians and US even there on mm. the visas and so on. Any other forecasts are not, not, not easy to do, but... Well, the Russian representative, Vladimir Shin, said that he doesn't believe that he will be present at the July session. There have been visa issues. The UAWG is always held in New York. And if the Russian diplomats don't get US visa, they can't participate. They can only watch on UN TV as the rest of us do. Uh, his forecast was that he will not get that visa and that the head of Russian delegation to the UN already had his visa rejected. And will... Krutsky was basically not there, right? Yes. Here. While he is, interestingly enough, the architect of the OEWG, we have to remember that this was the Russian initiative. They were the ones that suggested this format in the first place. So it will definitely be interesting to see the format in practice without its originator, let's say, like that. And it will definitely be interesting to see which countries will um, hmm, keep supporting Russia's position, so to say. There's this certain bloc that has more or less same positions on certain open questions. We are talking about Russia, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran. Uh, my forecast is that Iran will be taking uh, Russia's, um, let's say, position. They will be the ones to be in the forefront mm -hmm. of that bloc. Let's see, uh, it will definitely be uh, interesting times ahead of us in, in terms yes, of the indeed. process. Let's move to substance. Uh, so I'll bring in uh, my colleague Pavlina from the US. Uh, Pavlina was closely following on uh, uh, developments uh, when it comes to applicability of international law and discussions on that, on norms and so on. So Pavlina, what, was, what are the key takeaways uh, on substance of discussions in the Open Energy Working Group? Well, it was interesting. As Andriana said, this open-ended working group session was not, not something we've seen previously. And one of the, 
outcomes from the long discussion about multi-stakeholder engagement was that the chair within the international law session and session on norms uh, limited uh, the delegates to three minutes. So we get to see way more countries uh, with their highlight positions, but um, most of the more detailed positions are now in the written statements on, online. So with regards to norms, there are two sides or two types of countries. One, one type that is, let's say, European Union, Australia, US, uh, Argentina, and others, are those who would like to move on with implementation of current norms. They would like to take the 11 norms, which are currently based on the previous reports, and move on to the implementation, even though they're non-binding. The other group of uh, states, which uh, would be Russia, Cuba, Iran, Syria, think that these norms are insufficient and they need to be discussed in more detail. And they refer to the chair's summary uh, at the end of a uh, open-ended working group report from 2021. Um, then there is a discussion and split as we have seen in the previous uh, sessions of open-ended working group and also in the first round uh, about the need for a legally binding document, a new legally binding document um, even though the time was limited, the exchange was pretty heated about that. On one side, the countries like Belarus, Iran, Syria, spe specifically Russia, and as well China. China was not that uh, direct about it, but also would like to see a new legally binding document. Russia also said that they're ready to present to United Nations a draft of such a document, and China is going forth with their global initiative on cybersecurity, which should lead to a treaty. Um, regarding to specific norms, of course, the geopolitical uh, impacts were also seen. So there's um, more discussion needed about due diligence, attribution, and integrity of supply chains. So those three topics will be. With regards to international law, we also had a very interesting session because on one side, countries like EU, US, um, Australia, Japan, and others, so the majority of countries, do consider international law and the UN Charter in its entirety, based on the previous reports, applicable in cyberspace. And then we have statements which do not confirm this applicability and do not deny it. But one state in particular, and that was Cuba, went ahead and declared that specifically Article 51 of UN Charter is not applicable in any case in cyberspace. So that goes directly against what is uh, confirmed in the latest reports, an open-ended working group report in 2021 and in the GGE report. So it is, would be interesting to see to what level this would open up the key, the existing key, whether it is being challenged. And um, yeah, the states have really work cut out for them. So they were discussing on one side, splitting into work groups uh, on international law topics on, and on norms, on specific topics like attribution or sovereignty um, or armed conflict and applicability of humanitarian law. And then, uh, also, uh, the chair and the state would like to do the intercessional work. As Andriana said, um, the intercessional work will continue between the closed session right now and July. So we will see the outcomes later. Um, yeah, as far as just to add to what Andriana said, uh, we and to be a little bit more optimistic about the whole proceedings. <laughs> oh, oh, while the multi-stakeholder uh, engagement is not formally said. There were two stakeholder uh, informational meetings within this open-ended working group, which is a first, usually it's just one. And we do see more and more uh, state delegates participating in these sessions. So, especially from small and developing countries. So that's just a little bit of ray of light and we'll see how it goes through July. Over to you, Vlad. Um. 
Excellent, excellent overview. Uh, and uh, we can come back to some of the questions. I, I saw one of the questions in, in the chat, and I'm stealing that, Ginger, just to uh, to, to be in the in, in the uh, in the loop while we discuss it. I'll get back to you with some more comments from the chat, which is about Article 51 of the Charter, talking about or allowing a right to self-defense of states. And the question is, of course, in what cases the countries could have the right to self-defense. What does that mean? Uh, should a country have the right to self-defense in terms of all the means available or just cyber to cyber uh, and, and so on? Why small countries, uh, including Cuba or some, some countries, believe that this shouldn't apply? That's an interesting question, which I'll uh, pass back to, to Pavlina. Pavlina, do you want to reflect on that? What is the thinking behind uh, why Article 51 shouldn't directly apply to cyberspace? We have seen this opinion for a while now, especially in the first open-ended working group where Russia voiced it. Um, that was that basically the cyber attack will never amount to a traditional kinetic attack in, in its scope. Therefore, it cannot be considered as a use of force under UN Charter and cannot lead to the right of self-defense by the victim state. Uh, that is the basic... Uh, thinking behind this argument. Uh, what is interesting now is, of course, we are in a situation where we have a hybrid war in Ukraine and how this will be interpreted within the section. Well, Russia did not, after the open-ended working group report in 2021 and GGE report in 2021, which confirmed that the UN Charter applies to cyberspace, Russia didn't open this question anymore. So they moved on. However, Cuba is now opening it up, saying it will never amount to armed attack. It will never uh, trigger the right of self-defense by the victim state. And also, interestingly, it will never trigger the applicability of humanitarian law. So victims of cyber attacks would never actually, according to Cuba, um, be protected under humanitarian law regulations. I hope I answered your question, Lana. Thanks. Well, uh, I, I guess a longer elaboration of two hours would be needed to go into all the details because there are really many nuances which we are, we are trying to follow also on the on the digital watch page. We can go back to some some more of those issues, but just as a reminder, uh, what we got in 2021 uh, as the agreement of both the group of governmental experts and the Open Any Working Group, and ultimately confirmed by the all the countries by the consensus in the UN General Assembly was this what we call a framework of responsible state behavior in cyberspace or the ACI, as uh, Paulina referred to it, which says that the international law applies to cyberspace, including the UN Charter uh, and the uh, set of cyber norms and confidence building measures and so on. So reopening that, which was basically at the ground uh, that was supposed to be a, a beginning of the next discussions is sort of risky, but let's see how this is going to develop in, in future. Uh, let me pass on to Ginger. Ginger, I know there were some more reflections in the chat also on this multi-stakeholder uh, process. Uh, Ginger, over to you to summarize. I'm not sure I'm getting into the multi-stakeholder process. Um, we did talk uh, in the chat about uh, Elon Musk and other personal and business entities getting involved in the discussions, but I think that was already addressed. Um, just recently, there has been a spate of comments about uh, and discussion of the nuances of Cuba's stance on cyber attacks. Uh, particularly, I found Andre's comment that the issue of self-defense can only be considered after we solve the problem of attribution. But um, as the, Jovan points out, the main debate is about the threshold to what constitutes use of force in the cyber field. For instance, uh, we already know that hacks can take place um, in cyber tools and resources that will affect physical uh, installations. So does that intrude uh, then on physical and attributes that do allow uh, self-defense, do trigger self-defense. Pavlina has answered um, Jovan that yes, Cuba is concerned about kinetic response, but also denies humanitarian law applicability, which of course 
brings in a, another whole world of discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, and this discussion on the applicability of international humanitarian law is, is quite an interesting one. Paulina is particularly following on that. We're not going to elaborate uh, more on that one, at least not here, but we might make some follow up discussions. Uh, some of the arguments that states have is that uh, by accepting the international humanitarian law applies to cyberspace that uh, pushes for militarization or accepts the militarization of cyberspace and acknowledges that cyberspace is a domain for warfare. Uh, the others say de facto that's, that's what is happening and so on. Uh, but I, I want to get back, Andrea, to you with uh, uh, a quick question on what are the new topics and maybe processes? I, we heard from Pavlina that the Chinese have been reminding of their uh, data security, global data security initiative. Uh, there were some reflections on the program of action as, again, mm -hmm. the possible follow up process, but there were other interesting topics that were raised, probably not directly in the mandate of the Open Energy Working Group. What's new in this field? You have your classic ransomware, critical infrastructure, critical information infrastructure, which countries are concerned about. We haven't solved those issues, so it's obvious that we are mentioning them again, right? But we have had a mention by Russia of what they said are new threats in cyberspace, meaning that a country can be disconnected from the internet and that a country can be disconnected from SWIFT it's not a wonder that they mentioned it. First of all, there was a threat. Well, one, there was a threat that it would happen to them, and one thing actually did happen to them. But there are also, those are also very new threats, so to say, in the sense that they haven't happened to anyone yet. So it's absolutely normal that they mentioned them now. It's just in time because those things happened in February and March, and it was just in time for this, this OEWG. They were the only country that mentioned this true, but are they right as they are? That is a new threat that we haven't seen so far. It's something without precedent. So that's on, on new threats and on new processes. Yes, China did mention their initiative on data security. Russia also supported it. Well, at least said they support it. When it comes to the POA, this is something that's not new. We have been hearing about the POA uh, even in the first OAWG. Uh, the co-sponsors will now adjust and um, make new changes to their draft, in particular about how the POA should be established. We still don't know if it is established, where it's going to be established. The first very original proposal is saying that the POA should be established by the General Assembly, probably under the first committee. What the POA should do, it should be complementary to the OAWG. So if it is established, we'll have two processes. The POA will not be discussing anything. They will be operationalizing CBMs and capacity building, while the OAWG will continue its discussions on threats, norms, and, um, and international law. We'll see what happens. We still have to wait for July. So many things will happen in this intersessional period. Right now, I can only say, oh, we'll see about this, we'll see about that. But we genuinely don't have any more information at, at this point. But it will be definitely interesting to see what will happen by summer. And it's a long process, five years, so exactly. we can expect small, quick wins. Uh, one of the things, maybe on a, on a bright side, that we can mm. mention, uh, the first takeaway is certainly that in spite of the relations between U.S. and Russia and developments in Ukraine, uh, many were skeptical whether actually the process would be moving on with some, mm. let's say, uh, substantial discussions. It happened, whether they were in agreements or disagreements. And the other one that, that I found quite interesting was that there were some, um, let's say, uh, optimistic uh, uh, discussions, particularly in the part on confidence building measures and capacity building. And one of those that I spotted as a, as a very interesting one is that uh, what was set to be a, a network or a, a points of contacts of governments mm -hmm. agreed in 2021 as uh, diplomatic and technical points of contacts now might turn into a more proactive network or reactive even uh, mm -hmm. network when it comes to cyber incidents, maybe some sort of a operational body combining diplomats and technical community to react or proactively uh, address some, some risks. Probably we'll, we'll have to wait a few more years, but there might be some quick wins. Uh, I don't know whether you agree that we should be a little bit at least optimistic. 
I do and I don't. Because the points of contact is something that has been discussed since the very first OEWG. And CBMs and capacity building were always somewhat of a low hanging fruit. There weren't ever any major disagreement on that. And those were always the bright spots since September 2019 when OEWG started. So I'm not sure if this is something that we should celebrate because I'm not sure it's anything new. But time will show which one of us was right. Let's see, as you said, July and wait yes. for July, and then we go for holiday and miss it. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll give the last chance to Ginger because I know there were some more comments. Ginger, if you want to reflect on the final round and certainly add your thoughts uh, before we wrap up this discussion, Ginger. Uh, thank you, Vlada. Actually, I think we've been very busy listening to the discussion, and the panelists have been very interesting. However, uh, Pavlina did add a little more information for us. Um, one that the states proposed to discuss uh, much of this in the intersessional specialized work groups. And she clarified that China and Aus Australia had an interesting exchange on the question of attribution and whether the evidence related to attribution should be published. China says no, Australia says yes. There's also the question of technical, legal, and political attribution which complicates the responses and the possibility of continuing the, the discussions. So thank you. And thank you, Pavlina, Andre, and we've had a great discussion here with Nigel, Richard, and others. See, it's, it's quite, a, quite a fun in the chat. Um, I'm missing that. But thanks for bringing in the, 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 the snippets, at least, from that. Uh, we wrap up this topic and we'll move on to seeing what is the barometer of April. So basically looking at the most, well, the hottest or the highest pressure topics uh, of the last month. We mentioned, uh, of course, security. Most of our discussions were related to security. When it comes to content policy, uh, there were a couple of issues. We mentioned uh, the bit on disinformation. Uh, there was the Chinese uh, move uh, when it comes to uh, big technology companies and uh, more transparency about the algorithms and regulating the algorithms. At the same time, as we mentioned at the beginning, the European uh, Union has come very close to the final formal agreement on the Digital Services Act, which will again address the content, uh, hate speech, and all of those aspects. Uh, we still have to see the full text uh, that was uh, sort of informally agreed, uh, but most certainly we'll discuss that probably even uh, at the next briefing uh, in end of May. Uh, unless something unexpected happens. And then the last um, high pressure area is the emerging technologies. Things are shaping there. We see the new committee of the Council of Europe uh, starting the work on artificial intelligence and number of countries moving ahead with various research and cooperation in quantum technologies. We suppose that at some point in the near future, we'll also see the US, the new US uh, special envoy within the State Department on uh, emerging technologies. So we can expect some more discussions on emerging technologies and maybe in the next months, uh, one of the briefings will be focused on that. Uh, moving on to what's coming uh, in, uh, in the next month, basically in, in, in May, uh, there are a number of events that you can look at the Digital Watch uh, events. Uh, one of them is currently the e-commerce week, uh, which we are reporting from. So take a look at the digital watch and you'll be able to follow the live reporting from the event. Uh, the other one which is coming is the, the, the WUSIS, uh, again in, in Geneva, something we've been waiting for quite a long time during the COVID times is going on. So stay tuned to that. And uh, when it comes to DiploSide, uh, of course, the courses are running on and we'll keep you informed. There are a couple of blogs one of those by Andrean and the colleagues on the Open Any Working Group uh, uh, takeaways. So if you want to have a, a digest of that, just go to Diplo's website, you'll find the, the blog. With that, uh, let me just remind you, uh, before closing the, the briefing, that uh, the next uh, briefing will be the last Tuesday of May, uh, same time, same place. In the meantime, make sure that if you haven't done so, subscribe to the Digital Watch newsletter. No more cyber detente newsletter for the time being, let's see. Unfortunately. And, uh, and uh, follow Diplo's work. And uh, if not earlier, see you last Tuesday of May. Thank you for joining and bye-bye. Thank you, Mirana. You're welcome. Goodbye. <laughs>